And if there are any other time zones in the evening, very good evening to all of you. Um, I'm delighted to be invited to give a talk on a topic, an area that is very, very close to my heart. And um, you will learn more about me and what I do shortly. But once again, thanks for the opportunity. Um, I'll do my best to present information as fairly and as accurately as possible. But as is true for anything, there can always be errors. So please keep that in mind. So in my presentation today, I will briefly go over some professional highlights. Then I'll touch upon the cyber attack epidemic that is upon us. That will be followed by a quick overview of risks and vulnerabilities. And then I will get to the framework and the application of the framework. Finally, I will conclude with some closing thoughts. A quick check, uh, Ahmed, can you hear me? Is everything going well? Uh, yes, well done. Uh, okay. All is good. Thank you. So as Ahmed very kindly shared, um, I have been um, focusing on cybersecurity for over a decade now, alongside enterprise digitization. But in the big scheme of things, my research can be broadly described as strategic management of technologies. Cybersecurity governance, enterprise digitization are two research streams, if I may. I've been pursuing this research for over a decade and in my role as a professor, an author, an editor, a speaker, a consultant, and a strategic advisor, I strive to offer as much value as I, as I can, because as, you, as we all know, this cybersecurity is a huge challenge out there. And we need people from different walks of life, from different disciplines to contribute. It's not enough just for one educational domain or one type of expertise to address the cybersecurity challenge because there are so many aspects to that challenge. Once again, as Ahmed shared, I'm the author of Cybersecurity Readiness, a holistic and high performance approach. It's a Sage publication. This is where I describe the framework with examples, with case studies, with uh, tools uh, that can be used to assess uh, the state of readiness of an organization. So there are some valuable resources that you might consider checking out. You can either get the book from the publisher or you can get it from Amazon. Uh, what you see now are the three articles um, um, that I'm sharing with you, uh, which speak to some of the work I have been doing in the cybersecurity space of the three articles. Uh, the article type, uh, title, Calculated Risk, a Cybersecurity Evaluation Tool for SMEs, uh, has been listed as a most cited article uh, since 2020 in Business Horizons. You can purchase uh, the first two articles from the Harvard Business Publishing website. And then, of course, there is this Should Executives Go to Jail Over Cybersecurity? which I published a few years ago. You can get it from the Taylor and Francis website. Um, fairly recently, I also published these two articles, uh, Mission Critical, How the American Cancer Society Successfully and Securely Migrated to the Cloud During the Pandemic, and then um, wrote a piece on preventing security breaches must start at the top. And these, these have been published in um, a practitioner outlet called I by IMD. Many of you must have heard of IMD, the very well-known institution out of Lausanne, Switzerland. The Cybersecurity Readiness Podcast Series was launched in 2021, in, the June, in June 2021. I was, um, one of my undergraduate students wanted me to do a podcast. I wasn't sure. But because he was so persistent and he was so convincing to just please him, I said, OK, I'll do eight episodes and that will be the end of it. But, you know, in life, sometimes you don't know what you stumble upon. And that was the case here. 
uh, eight episodes is now, I have published 62 episodes. It's in the third year and I keep getting requests to come on the show and talk about their expertise, their solutions. So it's been a terrific experience. It has listeners in over 90 countries. I have shared with you the portal. Um, you can access all the episodes. Uh, there's lots of valuable information. Um, these podcast episodes are being used as teaching material in many classrooms. They're also being used as training material in many, many organizations. So I welcome you to access them, listen to them, provide feedback, subscribe, whatever you'd like. I think this is a, a resource for the global community. Um, and uh, it's, it's a passion of mine. And this is how I'm able to stay abreast of what's going on in the world of cybersecurity, because literally I get a guest every week. Uh, the guest could be a founder, the guest could be a CEO, the guest could be a chief security officer, um, and any other, you know, a variety of other subject matter experts who, sh who come and talk about what they are doing in the field of cybersecurity, how is it valuable. I get a lot of nonprofit organizations also talking about their cybersecurity initiatives. If you are interested in being a guest, Feel free to reach out and I'll be happy to chat with you. Um, you know, being in academia is very hard to do work in with practice, but I'm a practitioner at heart. I call myself a practice focused academic. I'm inspired by the work that I do that influences and hopefully transforms practice. So I've always found a way of staying connected with practice. And one of the ways was by being part of the Cybersecurity Leadership Council. And I also served on the Cybersecurity SWAT team. And that allowed me access to practitioners who would come to me for strategic advice. And I found that also very enriching. That's another source of knowledge that I've had over the last several years. I'm very honored and grateful that similar to today, I get invited to deliver talks in academic and practitioner forums around the world. I think this probably would be my 75th or 76th talk of the last four or five years. And I learn so much when I get the opportunity to present before all types of audience. You know, cybersecurity is everybody's business. Everyone has a role to play in dealing with the cyber attack epidemic. So we cannot leave any group or any community out. We cannot say that, yes, if we have the security engineers, we will be in good shape. The engineers can are very important, but they can only do so much. We also have to involve the generalists. We have to raise the level of cybersecurity awareness to the point that we have to start educating our kids from kindergarten. In fact, I have an episode coming up where a particular group will come and talk about their initiative of how they are trying to enhance cybersecurity awareness in the classroom from the very inception. So it has to become part of your mindset. There has to be an element of security paranoia if we want to help ourselves, help our group, our organization, our country, and the world deal with this terrible epidemic. I've also been very fortunate to be invited as an expert on various cybersecurity topics. Once again, I feel extremely blessed and always happy to contribute. So if you see any opportunities where I can help, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, and finally, um, I wanted to um, give a shout out to Duke University, where I'm a visiting prof, uh, prof. I'm part of their cybersecurity Master of Engineering program, where I have taught a class and I'm excited about participating in a CISO executive certificate program in the month of June, where I get to teach a session on cybersecurity strategy. Uh, Duke has been 
very, very good to me. And I am very grateful, honored, and fortunate to be part of this fabulous institution. Finally, um, I'm a very active researcher. I have edited numerous cybersecurity articles. And one of the latest initiative is this call for papers, where I'm collaborating with my colleagues in the United Kingdom, um, where we are requesting papers on digital adoption, cyber risks, and value destruction in organizations. This is a special issue that will be published in the journal Information Systems Frontiers. So that's kind of the background. Uh, and I hope you found that to be useful. Now let's talk a little bit about the cyber attack epidemic. And I'm sure that I will not be saying anything that is going to surprise you. But I'm saying it for a reason. And what's the reason? The reason is every time I check the numbers, they keep getting worse. The number of crime, uh, cyber crimes, the cost of a data breach, the cyber insurance premiums that organizations have to buy or would like to buy. And now with more and more remote work, the challenge becomes even more um, you know, unmanageable, let's put it that way. And you know, talking about cyber insurance, it's a great thing to get cyber insurance. But it is not easy to get cyber insurance. An insurance company will not um, will not provide coverage to an organization if the organization cannot prove to the insurance company that they have a certain level of cybersecurity readiness. And they also have to maintain that readiness if they want to keep being covered by the insurance. Even the cyber insurance industry, given that market, is a tough market and it will collapse if organizations don't do their part in securing themselves and assume that, oh, I have insurance. It doesn't matter if I get breached. It absolutely matters. In fact, you will not have insurance if you don't do your part. So organizations will have to be self-reliant. They can't just rely on external help and look the other way. As we all know, the impact of organizational data breaches has resulted in loss of revenue, drop in stock value, loss of potential business opportunities, loss of reputation. But you know something? It's the small and medium-sized businesses who are comparatively resource-starved. They are the ones that get hurt the most when they experience a cyber attack, a breach. The last time I checked the stats, 60% of small and medium-sized businesses go under within six months of being hacked. And that's precisely why we wrote that article directed at SMEs, which has become very highly cited. Because I think we have touched a chord. We have touched a need that's out there. And I, and I applaud ACFTI for making this resource available to the global community so everybody can benefit, benefit from it, including organizations who don't, can't afford, you know, the specialists, let's put it that way. So at least some free resources can help guide these organizations to do the best they can from the standpoint of cybersecurity due diligence. What is particularly concerning are the attacks on critical infrastructure. This is a global problem. Infrastructure of many, many nations are being compromised. I reside in the United States, so the examples are primarily from the US. In fact, once again, when I was updating the data here, I was absolutely appalled to learn from Christopher Ray's testimony how hackers are already entrenched in the civilian critical infrastructure waiting to make their next move. So that's how vulnerable, ladies and gentlemen, we are as individuals, as a group, 
as an organization, as a nation, as a global society. And unfortunately, this epidemic is not going away. I believe this is a, an even worse epidemic than the pandemic that we experienced. The pandemic showed us that we were not prepared. We were caught napping. We were found to be reactive. And that's the other motivation for me to be out there, willing to share my two cents, whoever is willing to listen, because I don't want another catastrophe to happen, which can have even greater consequences than what we experienced because of a cyber breach. These are all possibilities, and unfortunately, some of them are realities today. Whether it's a bank failure, whether it's the collapse of the financial market, contamination of water supply, and unfortunately, nuclear attacks cannot be ruled out either. Several years ago, Warren Buffett had made the statement. I agreed with him then, and I agree with him now. These are wise words, and we must learn, we must pay heed to what he has to say and continue to do our best. So once again, I applaud all of you who are listening in, who are participating and who are playing, doing their own part in this battle to make the world a safer place. As far as cyber risks and vulnerabilities go, folks, once again, I don't plan to preach to the choir here. Probably some of you or most of you have more expertise than I have. But the reality is, the more digitized we get, the greater are the attack surfaces, the greater are the vulnerabilities. The more we depend on cloud-based services, the more vulnerable we become. Because even if the data is secure in a cloud service provider, those repositories can be breached. In a high, highly mobile work environment where organizations are allowing remote work while they have their protocols and their best practices, it's not always feasible for their employees to follow those protocols because they could be in environments where they don't have the secure connection and they're tempted to use any connection to get the work done. So that creates many more vulnerabilities. And then we have the Internet of Things devices and other smart devices. We take great pride in saying we have smart cities, we have smart appliances, we have smart hospitals. Hopefully we recognize that there comes a price with that smartness. It's making us even more vulnerable. So unless we are careful, bad things can happen. In fact, they are happening. The hacker community is a very sophisticated community. They are constantly developing new tools, new methods. With the advent of AI, they have become even more powerful. So as their expertise keeps evolving, the organizations, the individuals have to keep up with them. But the problem is, for the hackers, that's their source of revenue, source of income. They have a motivation to do what they do. For us, unfortunately, it's a distraction. If you talk to the CEO of, say, a Nike or a CEO of, say, a General Motors, they are likely to say, you know, I'm not in the business of cybersecurity. I'm in the business of manufacturing great shoes, manufacturing great cars. Why should I have to spend so much time trying to ensure that we are totally protected. And that's a fair statement to make. But unfortunately, the reality is, and they, I'm sure they recognize it as well, that they have to do their part because if they don't secure their organization, the consequences can be disastrous. So there is no getting away from dealing with the different types of attack vectors. And this is uh, an evolving, a moving target. So we have to be constantly on our feet doing that cutting edge research so we can you know do the best we can from a defensive standpoint desirably 
We want to be more proactive. Another re reality of the cyber, cyber um, phenomenon is that humans continue to be the most vulnerable factor. There are numerous breach cases where it just took one person to follow through with a link or to make a mistake, a slight error in judgment, and the systems got compromised. And because these systems are connected, because we believe in digitization, there are some economies of scale and scope when systems talk to each other. But when one system gets compromised, this strength of interconnect interconnectedness becomes a huge weakness. And that's what's happening. That's all the hackers need is to compromise one individual. And folks, that's the reason why I said earlier, it's not enough to have a team of cybersecurity experts trying to protect an organization. Unfortunately, we are not there yet with the kind of technology we need to provide us that secure cover. We also need the individuals to do their part. So within the scope of their work, they need to know what they should be doing to secure the way they work, the way they perform. And organizations are recognizing it. My research, where I reviewed data breach re records for over a decade, finds that broadly, the organizational weaknesses and shortcomings can be classified into four buckets. Gross negligence, lack of transparency, poor communication, and inadequate preparation. And why do I say that? Let me share with you some instances, and I'm sure you have seen these as well. So I'm not going to surprise you. Usernames and passwords are not encrypted. Weak encryption systems are being used by organizations. Unencrypted customer data stored in multiple locations. Networks not adequately segmented. Multi-factor authentication not in place. Delay in notifying victims. The breach went undetected for several weeks. The company did not pay heed to the alerts sent by the monitoring company. Misconfigured web application firewall. Lack of a well-rehearsed disaster recovery and incident response plan. Folks, when we look at this list, you almost want to conclude that organizations don't know what they're doing, they lack awareness, they're like, let things happen, and once th bad things happen, we will do what needs to be done. That's the kind of impression you would get when you see this. And unfortunately, that is a reality. Time and time again, I get subject matter experts coming on my podcast to tell me that they've organizations continue to be in a reactive mode. Until something bad happens, they don't really sit up and, work, and do all that they have to do. Yes, legislations have come in. There are some industry guidelines. There are some security guidelines that many organizations strive to follow. But here is the challenge. There are too many of them. Sometimes when you see these control frameworks, they have 100 controls. And the specialists, the implementers, they get overwhelmed. And so the implementation and the sustenance is a challenge. So what is needed? We need cybersecurity governance to shift from a reactive to a proactive mode. We need organizations to do the right thing from a security standpoint and not wait for regulations to require them to do it. Organizations need to be very substantive about security, not just somehow check the box, wing it if they can, so, get, so they get that compliance certificate so they can get that next contract. To put it simply, you need to do all that is being asked of you well. There are lots of great guidelines out there. There are lots of great tools out there. 
It is the effective implementation and sustenance, sustenance of that implementation that is key. So how do you do that? How do you create and sustain a high level of readiness by creating an appropriate culture? Unless you have an appropriate culture in place, ladies and gentlemen, the cybersecurity performance of, a, of an organization will be up and down. When they have good leaders with credibility, with good rapport with the other C-level executives, the cybersecurity performance will be on a high. When some of these leaders leave the organization and are replaced with folks who don't have that credibility, who don't have access to the resources they want, there's going to be a drop in performance. And once again, depending on the nature of the organization, those organizations who don't see cybersecurity as a strategic competency, when there is a drop in revenue, they're unlikely to support the cybersecurity budget. So the, there's going to be a budgetary fluctuation, which again affects performance. So therefore, it is very important to build that cybersecurity DNA, where organizations recognize its significance, its importance, and keep doing their part without waffling and maintaining a steady state, a high, a high level of readiness or over a long period of time. This is the focus needs to be long term and not short term. So that's where the framework comes in. I've used labels that you can relate to. If, you, if an organization shows a high level of commitment, a high level of preparedness, a high level of discipline, they are likely to be on the right path towards proactive cybersecurity readiness. So what's special about this framework? What makes it relatively unique and distinctive? It takes a holistic approach. It's driven by the belief that technology alone will not mitigate information security risks. There are several pieces to the complex puzzle of cybersecurity manage, management, and technology is only one of them. There are several other success factors, such as committed leadership, robust governance procedures, and informed and motivated personnel. This framework will guide the organization to adopt a proactive, long-term, and sustainability-focused approach. It's going to help the organization create and sustain a high-performance information security culture. This is the kind of culture that exists in the US nuclear Navy, where the founder of this organization believed in creating such a culture because in that industry, if there is one error, not only does the ship blow off, but it also causes major environmental damage. So I drew inspiration and ideas from that framework that was developed in the context of a military organization. And I wanted to popularize it amongst organizations, both for-profit and non-profit, with a belief that even if you are at 65 to 70% from the standpoint of commitment, preparedness, and discipline, you're going to be in much better shape than you are right now. Finally, last but not the least, this framework is research driven. After extensive research and data gather gathering, plus a lot of analysis, robust analysis, I came up with 17 success factors that are associated with the three dimensions I mentioned, commitment, preparedness, and discipline. So here is a glimpse 
of the seven success factors that, that are associated with the commitment dimension. Each of these factors are described in the book with questions that will guide the organization, the leadership, to assess how well they are doing for each of these categories, let's say, success categories. Then there is a preparedness dimension, which aligns with the popular frameworks out there, whether we're talking about NIST, whether we're talking about ISO 27001, whether we're talking about CIS. This dimension focuses on all the technical controls to help an organization identify the risks, prioritize risks, establish a defense in depth strategy, have sophisticated detection mechanisms, and also have structures in place to respond and recover as efficiently and effectively as possible. Finally, discipline. This is where the framework brings to light very important factors such as continuous monitoring. And it goes beyond that by suggesting that monitoring is not good enough. It has to be backed by prompt processing and action. Security audits and drills. Once again, the devil lies in the detail. The audits needs to be real time. Just like fire drills, organizations need to have security drills. So what the framework does it provides guidance on how to do the different types of defense measures well. One more I, um, uh, success factor that I wanted to touch upon has to do with awareness and training, and I'll get to that shortly. Many organizations do awareness and training, but the question is, do they do it well? How customized is it? How immersive is it? How targeted is it? So once again, the question to ask is, yes, we have checked the box that we are doing cybersecurity awareness training, but are we doing it well? Are we assessing our performance properly? So therefore, the approach to cybersecurity readiness needs to be substantive. So as I said, the, my book provides a pragmatic and comprehensive guide. The feedback that I have received is that it's very intuitive and easy to follow. There are guiding questions for reflection, self-assessment, and validation. And then there are numerous examples that illustrate the applicability and value of the framework. Finally, I also provide you with a set of scorecards that serves as a self-assessment tool for organizations. For each of the 17 success factors, folks, there is a scorecard. So you, there will be 17 scorecards that you can use to assess how your organization is doing for each of those success factors. The data was gathered from primary and secondary sources. We used a multi-method approach. In-depth interviews were conducted with business leaders and subject matter experts. I was able to get insights across a variety of industries. And the analysis that I did was primarily qualitative using a tool called NVivo, using cluster analysis, and so on and so forth. And I continue to gather data, as I shared with you, through the podcasts are a huge source of information, plus the research that I'm, I'm pursuing. So I haven't stopped enhancing this framework. It's a work in progress. And hopefully, you will find opportunities to help further enhance the validity and robustness of the framework, modify it, improve upon it. You know, it's entirely up to you how you plan to use it. I hope you find it useful. Finally, I'd like to touch upon some of the highlights of the application of this framework. In the interest of time, 
I did talk about it already, but I'll run through them really quick. In the big scheme of things, folks, I think organizations should look at cybersecurity as a strategic opportunity. If they do a good job following the framework, it is likely that their cybersecurity competencies will be enhanced. And you can measure those competencies along the lines of proactiveness, resiliency, transparency, robustness, and awareness. And these competencies are likely to help organizations enhance their strategic capabilities, which in turn will have a positive impact on strategic outcomes. So what I'm trying to suggest is the leadership see cybersecurity as a strategic opportunity. That will motivate companies to take the right steps to build the competencies, which will actually give them a leg up in competition. So instead of looking at cybersecurity as a pain, as a cost of doing business, let somebody else handle it, ha handle it. Why not embrace it? Take it as an opportunity, as a challenge, and make it your strength, which in turn will pay dividends. I think that kind of positive mindset is essential if we want to really make an impact when it comes to protecting the organization from the different types of attacks. So of the 17 success factors, folks, I'll touch upon a, a few really quick. Hands-on top management. Management has to actively engage. They have to take ownership and responsibility. They have to serve on governance teams. It's like the parents sending kids to a good school and saying, oh, I send my kids to a good school. My kids will turn out right. It doesn't work that way. You also have to be hands-on, do the parenting if you care for your kids. So if the organization recognizes that cybersecurity is an important part of their value proposition, is or could become a strategic capability, they need to put in the time. And you can structure it in a manner and a fashion where you're not having to devote your entire time to this. So I'm not trying to suggest the leadership give up their roles and all focus on cyber, I'm saying find a mechanism, find a structure whereby you stay plugged in, you are aware what the company's strengths are, what the company's weaknesses are, what steps are being taken to plug those weaknesses. And that can pay off big time in the long run. It's also important to work towards creating that cohesive culture where everyone will do their part. And I like to use the analogy of building emotional capital. There's some research there. But how do you create emotional capital? How do you create that sense of belonging, that sense of pride? How do you ensure that when the leaders are encouraging people to do their part, the people are likely to listen? So how do you create genuine and authentic leadership to ensure that they can be effective cybersecurity evangelists. And finally, you've got to incentivize behavior. There has to be a motivation. In other words, in your performance evaluation, commitment to cybersecurity training, commitment to cybersecurity initiatives should be included. So there is also an incentive to, to keep cybersecurity at the back of their mind when they are doing their regular work. Um, very big on joint ownership and accountability. As I said earlier, cybersecurity is everybody's business. You can't just say, we have a cybersecurity team, we have a CISO, if something goes wrong, it's their problem, we're gonna fire them, and we're gonna look good to the outside world. No, that's not a solution. That's symbolism. If you really want to make a meaningful change, a meaningful improvement, in your cybersecurity posture, there has to be joint ownership and accountability. Everyone has to play their part. It is easier said than done, but even if an organization can take steps in this direction, it's better. that's better than just going back to that offshore, offshoring or outsourcing model. There's no problem seeking external expertise. 
but it has to be managed, it has to be complemented by internal commitment, cross-functional commitment. We all know that CISOs should be present, they should be appointed, but do organizations do enough to appropriately empower them? Do organizations establish the right structure where the CISO function can monitor and report objectively? Those are the things that need to be thought. And these are not explicitly stated in the controls that are widely touted out there. These are the harder challenges. And that's the reason why you could check the box and say, we have a CISO, so we are doing the right thing. But how effective is the CISO? Have you empowered the CISO? That's why even if you check off the 99 controls, let's say, and you run into trouble, What's the reason? Is because you didn't go deeper into those controls. And that's where I think the framework helps. I'm not trying to suggest my framework is better than the others. I feel my framework complements the other frameworks, augments the other frameworks. And so I hope you give it due consideration. I mentioned this earlier. You must, organizations must treat cybersecurity as strategic investments and must have a plan to support these investments over the long run. This cannot be a stop, stop and start. When I have the money, I'll invest. When I don't have the money, sorry, that kind of an ad hoc approach is not going to pay off in the long run. This is a problem that I hear over and over again. I was just doing an episode on securing application programming interfaces. And the subject matter expert says, Dr. Chatterjee, do you know companies are overwhelmed with the number of APIs they use to the point they don't even keep track of them. They don't even know whether all those APIs are robust or secure. And that's the problem. There is so much technology being used but unless you keep track of them, unless you wet them, you are likely to leave open vulnerabilities and fall prey to different types of attacks. I talked about the defense in depth approach, which is a combination of physical, technical, and, and administrative controls. And that's, you've got to prioritize what you want to secure and then vigorously apply this approach to secure those digital assets. I even talked about awareness and training. It needs to be role-based. It needs to be incremental and continuous, like Word, Wordle and Nerdle organizations should come up ways to make it fun. Don't try to teach uh, cybersecurity at, in a huge workshop at one shot. Do it incrementally, almost on a daily basis, maybe send an email with a, quiz question with a, with a fun question about cybersecurity and slowly build up the knowledge and make it also fun and interesting. So a little bit of creativity needs to come into play as organizations strive to enhance the overall level of awareness. I can't emphasize enough the importance of backups and the importance of having a very effective retention strategy. As you all know, ransomware attackers go first for the backups. They know where to hit hard. And so keeping that in mind, organizations will have to be extra vigilant, extra careful in how they manage their backups, where they store it, and they need to rehearse and rehearse how to quickly recover from different types of attacks. It's not enough to have the plan in the books. You've got to practice it. I did an episode on tabletop exercises. You may want to check it out where the subject matter expert talks about the importance of conducting these rehearsed training sessions because the more you practice, the better you will be when you have to deal with the situation live. I've talked about continuous monitoring and prompt action. There are tons and tons of cases, ladies and gentlemen, where monitoring is being done Alerts are being received, but they are not being acted upon. What's the point of spending money and getting the alerts 
if you're not going to quickly do something about it. So organizations must be suitably structured, must be suitably organized to take prompt action. I talked about highly rehearsed response and recovery capabilities, so I'm going to skip the slide. I also talked about the importance of real-time audits. Reactive audits are OK. I used to be an auditor in my first professional life. It's good to have a historic insight into why certain things happen. But cybersecurity requires real-time monitoring, real-time audit, so you can prevent the problem from getting worse. You can plug the vulnerabilities before and the organization becomes a victim. So in closing, folks, the mindset needs to change. Organizations, the leadership needs to treat cybersecurity as a strategic competency, as a strategic capability. They need to recognize that everyone has a role to play in securing the organization. The approach needs to be proactive with a high level of preparedness, continuously monitor and making, make adjustments, promptly act on the intelligence received, and continuous training. And please don't try to dodge this challenge by outsourcing it. Face it head on, deal with it, and you'll be better for it. With that, I end my presentation. I thank you for the opportunity. And feel free to reach out later, because I know I've used up all the time with questions and comments. And I will do my very best to respond. Thanks again for this opportunity and for listening to me.